Welcome back to another Broken Banners Battle Report. Early disclaimer, if you want to get straight into action and just watch some little plastic war dollies get moved around and dice thrown and all that good kind of mayhem, go ahead and skip to about 20 minutes in. There's going to be a pretty lengthy narration of lists and strategy before this starts because this is going to be one of our first installations of a tournament series that we're doing. So if you want to hear all that juicy analysis and hear my nasally voice, stay tuned for it. Today's episode is a little bit special, as I'm going to be reviewing and analyzing the videos without the benefit of both players' perspective like we normally do. This video, and the next few I'm going to be putting out, will be tournament reports, and I'll essentially be doing a one-sided report where I talk about my strategy in greater detail as I play it through an event, which also includes list selection. This is going to be one of three games that I had a chance to record while I played at the Pennsylvania Qualifier at the Banish Zone on May 11, 2024. It was a four-round qualifier event, and I was really grateful to have the opportunity to play with everybody there. I knew a few people there already, but I got to play with a lot of people I've never been able to play games with before, and that's always a really exciting experience and one of my favorite things about going out to events. This episode's still going to be probably shorter than most of our reports, and I'm actually kind of glad about that, because there's something I think a lot of people, especially newer players, don't quite comprehend about events, and that is the clock is one of your greatest challenges. In this report, you're going to see that the sands of time were ticking against the Martells and Game of Thrones. I played Dennis Malister against a local player's Jokin. My opponent was a relatively newer player, but he did a really good job and I had a great time against him. And considering how many games he's gotten in, especially with what I think is a challenging faction, Martells, he did a great job. And I'm really glad he was okay with me turning this into a battle report because I really want to show off how well he did, as well as provide a valuable learning lesson to everyone else, and also because I need all the experience against Martells I can get. Those guys are terrifying. For those who aren't entirely aware on how tournaments are run, go check out that segment that we did in the local conversation that Jan and I had. It's in one of our previous recorded videos that you'll be able to find on our channel. This was my first round, and I got played up against Martells, and I've only played against him once in the past year, and I had understood that at that point he had gotten a lot better and had gotten a few more games under his belt. We generally don't have many Martell players in my local area either, so this is probably the most difficult time I had the entire event of choosing a list for my matchup. Before I go take a look at his list, I want to go over my list that I brought to the event. Generally, as a standard rule, whenever I go to an event for two lists, I try and bring a mobility list and an attrition list. That way, I can play around my faction's strengths and weaknesses and try and play around my opponent's strategy based on their lists and their faction identity. For my attrition list, I brought Dennis the Menace Malister. Dennis Malister brings some control cards that are very unique to the Night's Watch faction, which for the most part focus on their own units rather than interacting with opponent's units. Dennis brings two cards that I really like that come with condition token manipulation. Tempered by Duty, which creates a fair amount of tokens over the course of the game, and Adaptive Planning, which allows you to shuffle them around and even peripherally some of those tokens. Combat Prowess allows you to either remove tokens from yourself, or more importantly, expend a condition token on an enemy unit that gets targeted to cancel out the abilities or the effect of that. Dennis' commander attachment is, I think, one of the worst in the games, which is probably fair considering his cards are so great. His first one allows you to whip out Tempered by Duty, but it falls off with a panic test now, so starting the game off with that is just begging for a Crown Zap, and since you're going to be sticking him in most likely a 5-up morale unit, Crown Zap takes you to a 6, there's a fair chance that you just fail the panic test, take a couple wounds, and lose one of your commander cards before you even get a chance to resolve its ability. And it kind of sucks to be playing with a 19-card deck after that. So unless you're bringing Jor, you're going to have to deal with that. On top of that, he's got Nightly Vow, which I also think is pretty lame, especially in Night's Watch, because you're already hitting on 3-up. So when you control the swords, you hit up 2s, which is nice, but since you already have so many access to rerolls, it's not that important. The charge reroll bonus when you declare against a unit is nice, especially if you've got Ranger Hunters, because they want the charge rerolls and they're going to be targeting a specific unit. However, if you're using a more defensive unit, which I like with his playstyle, it doesn't do you that much good because you probably don't care if you're the one that's getting charged. 
With that in mind, I stick Dennis inside his signature Shadow Tower Spearman, hailing from the same Fortress of the Night's Watch that he himself leads. I really don't have a particular reason to stick him in the Spearman instead of the Veterans, except that I would have someone I'd rather stick in Veterans than Spearman, so he just goes where he fits. It's pretty interchangeable if you like. Do what you need to if you want to copy off to this list. The other unit is the other defensive infantry that the Night's Watch has, Veterans of the Watch. Veterans of the Watch are notorious for their disrupt counter-strike combo, and having access to any weakened token generation is really useful. I've heard that a lot of people have been running Sandor in the Veterans because Threaten guarantees a weakened token. I prefer Gren. One, because he's Night's Watch. Two, because I already have him painted. And three, because I really like Taunt after the change. So when you stick him in the Veterans of the Watch, I think it works out a lot better than the Shadow Tower Spearmen, because while people might be deterred from charging Shadow Tower Spearmen, they already were due to the set for a charge that they have. People are more inclined to charge the Veterans of the Watch since you've got Disrupt, and they hope, usually, that the charge rerolls will help cancel that out, but once they get bogged in, that's when they start wanting to retreat. Against Shadow Tower Spears, you probably want to stay locked in with them just to prevent them from going somewhere else and making use of their set for charge ability and positioning them someplace you don't want them. So, I like Gren in the Veterans of the Watch. Next, I've got my favorite unit probably in the game, and that's going to be Ranger Trackers with the Watch Marshal. He is going to be giving you Swift Retreat on a very mobile, short-range cavalry unit, which is just right there worth the point. On top of that, he's also going to be giving you adaptive planning, which not only synergizes really well with Dennis Malster, but it works great with Ranger Trackers themselves, who have got Mark Target. So you can use adaptive planning in a ton of ways, whether it to be manipulating the tokens on yourself to make sure you're never weakened or to avoid panicked if you got a lot of vows on you, or to turn that vulnerable token into something useful like a weakened token and really blunt a charge. Finally, I have Cold Hands because I needed a 5-point unit. I haven't been a huge fan of Scorpions in this list because they're really slow and overall my list is kind of lacking in mobility with two infantry units that just kind of want to plonk onto an objective and I also haven't been enjoying Conscripts for a similar reason. Conscripts are a little bit more maneuverable than the Scorpion but they still are a giant target. Cold Hands can defend himself with Ravenflock and really good defensive stats, and he's really mobile having his own cavalry maneuver and being speed 5. Plus, Ravenflock is just such great synergy with Veterans of the Watch, whether to be dealing with a ranged unit or to absolutely shred apart anyone that's silly enough to engage in melee with them by stacking with Disrupt to give them a minus 2 to hit and set them up for a huge counter-strike. For NCUs, I have Donald Noy, Eamon, and Corin. Donald Noy and Eamon are just staples of the Night's Watch faction, as far as I'm concerned. Donald Noy is absolutely fantastic, having so much flexibility and either giving you a much better offensive attack that ignores a weakened token for the duration of that attack and giving you rerolls, or for giving you plus one to your armor and ignoring that vulnerable token for there. Not being able to expend those tokens is really nice, especially against Martells, and it can really help give you that little bit of extra push you need to either push get damage through or to survive a big attack. Eamon just brings a ton of healing. Independent of any zones, he's bringing a lot, and everybody knows the classic combination of Eamon's on bags, healing a last rank unit up six. Corrin, I think, even after the nerf, is a really strong NCU. He's definitely not as good as he was before, but being able to deny attacks and charges for an entire round is great, especially in a defensive list. And the vulnerable token's just a little bit of extra gravy. I'd probably take him even if he didn't put that out. Even without a sacrifice for the cause ability, getting an extra attack die on ranged and melee attacks is really nice. I most often put it on my ranger trackers because those guys are my major damage output, and they love an extra die, especially with Donald Noy. My second list is Benjen Stark Beyond the Wall. I'm not going to spend too much time going through this list because this isn't the list I played in this game. But just to help everyone understand why I chose the list that I did, my Benjen list is focused a lot more on being able to surgically strike units that are vulnerable. Start picking enemies apart one at a time and then go around for the objectives. Off the bat, these guys don't do well sitting around on objectives because they're cavalry and they're only going to have the two ranks. They want to circle around and they want to pick apart at flanks and rears. 
I've got a lot of kill potential in the commander unit because with the vulnerable generation that I've got and the outflank hidden traps, which is a disgusting combination that you can see in one of the later reports that I'll do, it can just be absolutely horrific to an unprepared unit. That said, it does not want to get bogged down. If the cavalry get locked down, that's probably it for them. Hedge Knights, I like a lot just in general, but other than that, two Ranger Trackers without swift retreat from the Watch Marshal, they're just going to get shred apart. My opponent is playing Martels, and they are high mobility. They're relatively lightly armored, but they have a lot of control, both in their effects and their condition token play, and they have a lot of ways to make sure that you're making sh crappy attacks. Martels have a lot of strong tricks against very aggressive factions, and because Martels have the ability to blunt a lot of very strong charges and draw enemies out into prolonged engagements, their lighter armor is a lot less relevant than you might think. With their control and condition tokens, you're never playing the game you want to. You are playing by their rules. So, when we started setting up, I got a chance to look at my opponent's two lists. A Jokin list and a Daemon Sand list. Unsurprisingly, both lists have Royal Guards and Sand Skirmishers, both of which are absolutely fantastic units. Royal Guard can blunt just about any charge and give a strong hit right on back, and Martial Training is going to give them the ability to put out that vulnerable token and get rerolls, so they don't care that much if they get the charge. Shield Wall allows them to blunt just about any melee attack, and in some case, outright resist any damage that you might get from it. Sand Skirmishers are another staple of the Martell faction. They're high mobility at speed 6, and they also have a short ranged attack, but their claim to fame is Quick Fire, which is allowing them to make a ranged attack after they make a maneuver or a retreat. So essentially, Sand Skirmishers are acting the same as my Ranger Trackers, except instead of Mark Target and Pathfinder, they've got a little bit better of an armor profile, which allows them to play more aggressively, and they could shoot off a retreat. But more importantly, they've got scout openings, which is going to give them rerolls when they use it, and precision, or it could allow them to support somebody else. Both lists also have the same NCU suite, which is going to be Alaria Sand, Arian Martell, and Eris Okart, which makes sense. They're a great trio on their own, and they work really well together. Eris Oakheart looks pretty unassuming when you first look at him, because he's only got his once per game ability, which is allowing him to stay on an NCU spot at the end of the round, and he'll be there at the start of the next round, and you can't activate him. He puts out a weakened token at the start of the round if he remains on the tactics board, and can seem a little unassuming at first, but he combos extremely well with the Martell deck, which cares a lot about your enemy not being able to claim the crowns, the uh, sword zone and not targeting the units that they want to and he works really well with alaria alaria just by herself removes a condition token when she takes his own but if you control the swords she also gets to put out a condition token on somebody in long range she used to be nuts and put out two condition tokens and i've heard a lot of martel players say that it's crime that she can only put out one token but with the introduction of eris okart i am really glad we don't have to deal with two tokens whenever she's controlling the swords, or anyone is controlling the swords. On top of that, you have Arianne Martell, who is a great control piece. She's got an influence, and you can choose one of the two of those when you place her out. When she's influencing an enemy unit, attachments on that unit lose all abilities, which is really nice for dealing with commanders that have some very powerful abilities. And the second one, this is big, can shut off essentially all friendly orders because it forbids the enemy unit from being the target of friendly orders, and orders always target the unit that's using the order. So essentially, it just shuts off all the orders. Against units such as my Ranger Trackers that have three orders when they have a Watch Marshal on them, it's a really powerful influence. The difference between my opponent's two lists are the commander and the unit the commander is in, and in one case, a couple attachments. The first list is Damon Sand in the Royal Guard. Damon Sand gives some much needed healing to the Martell army through Rally Cry and additional token generation through Intimidation of the Crown. Damon's card gives him a burst of aggression with a need for vengeance, which is going to allow him an early attack that can buff Damon's unit if that's the one that's attacking. Coordinated plotting is going to give some extra action economy by allowing a unit in long range of the attacker to perform a maneuver or retreat, which is giving the Martells an already zippy faction some extra pep. Pathetic Attempt is going to punish an enemy for failing to deal a significant amount of damage against on an attack, which is just going to fit so well against Royal Guard, and it makes sense that Damon Sand is inside of there. With all the weakened token 
generation that Damon and Martell army as a whole is going to have. Pathetic Arm Attempt is a really scary card that can always be lurking just behind your opponent's hand. The two supporting units in the Damon Sand list are Martell Spearmen, which give tactical reposition and some extra mobility to Martells, and Starfall Knights, which allow you to convert some of that mobility into absolute destructive power. Starfall Knights are Lance Cavalry, so right out the get-go, they hurt a lot, being able to throw up to 10 dice at with Sundering hitting on threes. At speed six, they're already fast, and any additional maneuvering you can give them is going to guarantee that they're going to be able to get into the flank or the rear of an enemy. And combine that with the Sundering, your armor's not going to do much against these guys. On top of that, they also bring Ambush, which is going to generate additional tokens for Martells. It's going to be specifically Panicked and Weakened that Ambush puts out. So the only thing Starfall Knights to need to start really threatening a one-shot is some vulnerable token generation. And Martells have a lot of flexibility in the tokens they can put out. It's not too difficult for them to get some vulnerable tokens out. The second list is very ranged heavy. Jokin is a neutral commander, and he's bringing Overwatch to the unit that he's in, which is a pretty rare order that allows a range unit to get some extra couple shots if they're well positioned. And with the amount of mobility that Martells are focusing on, they're all about positioning. So Jokin's going to have some great positioning available to him to make sure that Overwatch is a complete threat to anybody nearby. He also brings Diversion Tactics, which is going to give him some extra maneuverability, and Martells are all about that. You've also got Stalwart Mercenaries, which is going to give them either a plus on their morale test or just straight-up auto-passing, which combine that with Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken, you can never rely on a Martell unit failing their panic test. Then, finally, you've got his claim to fame, Brothers in Arms. That's going to increase the base attack die, but it can only be attached to a Stormcrow unit. So, that's really its big limit. And specifically in this list, Jokin's going to be in Golden Company Crossbowman, so he can't get the benefit of his own Brothers in Arms, but he's still got Overwatch and Sentinel and Diversion Tactics, and, well, you get the idea. They're really maneuverable for a pretty hard-hitting unit. The supporting unit you have here is going to be Stormcrow Mercenaries, who can benefit from uh, Brothers in Arms. And there you have Gerald Dane. He's bringing Insight and Furious Charge. So Stormcrow Mercs are always going to be throwing at their max attack die, 7, and you add on Brothers in Arms, and all of a sudden they're throwing out 9, maybe more, and it gets very scary very quickly even though they're only hitting on fours. And with the Vulnerable Token off of Furious Charge and the Vicious off of Insight, well, for a 5-point unit, that's a lot of damage. There's also a Spear Lord in the Scan Skirmishers, which is going to give them an extra die as well, which seems to be a common theme in this list. So there's a lot of damage spread out across the units. And whenever you bring Jokin, you get Widower for free, and he is an absolutely steroided out attachment. He's giving you Sundering, which is a really nice keyword, Jokin's Vassal, which is useful since Jokin's two of three cards care about having Jokin around, and he gives Hold the Line. Sticking this unit in Royal Guard turns them into what Sworn Brothers of the Night's Watch wish they were. They're almost always throwing out seven dice. They're going to have rerolls, sundering, and a vicious token, a uh, vulnerable token. Plus, on top of that, you also have hold the line. So if you start off engaged with them, you're just going to get shred apart. And you might even get killed in a single activation, which is terrifying. So, looking at these two lists, I knew from the outset that mobility was going to be something that either list was bringing in spades. This kind of deterred me from bringing my cavalry list, because on one hand, while my cavalry list could keep up with his list, it's keeping up with his list. And the cavalry need to be able to out-position to really get the benefit. Otherwise, if cavalry are just getting bogged down and fighting in some more traditional combat... I'm going to lose out, especially in an objective game mode like Game of Thrones where you've got five objectives and you have to worry about contesting. I've got it much two ranks, and he's got a ton of infantry that can contest me, even if their armor saves kind of suck like Martell Spearman at a five up. Royal Guard will absolutely shred anything that I've got, and although the ranged attacks are really nice against the Royal Guard, with Starfall Knights on one hand and then two range units on the other, I'm not even sure if my ranger trackers are going to be able to sufficiently threaten the Royal Guard. 
I think that he's going to be trying to get me locked into melee combat, either list I go. So I decide to pick the list that wants to be dragged into melee combat. If he wants to drag this round out to round six with tokens all over the place, I am more than happy to play the same game. With Dennis Malister, I can keep up with his condition token play, and he can go ahead and outmaneuver me all he wants. Even those Starfall Knights, which is probably one of the scariest things he's got between his two lists, are going to be hitting 5-ups after Ravenflock and Disrupt, and if I can keep the weakened tokens out on them, I'm not too worried about just about anything. Even the ranged units, who could really poke some holes in my plans, since the veterans don't get their Disrupt on that and Ravenflock's only ones, so the Jokin list is a bit of a concern if I go with the infantry list, I'm hoping I can put out enough healing and weaken token generation that I can push on through. My opponent decides on the Jokin list rather than the Demon Sand list, which the game, as mentioned, was Game of Thrones. And I think that said, the double range list is probably going to be better for the Game of Thrones list than the Maneuver Starfall Knight list, because the Starfall Knights don't want to sit on objective either. They're Lance Cavalry. They also don't want to get bogged down. So it makes sense that he went with the Archer list for this one. And I'm just going to have to rely on tools like Corrin and Healing to make sure that I can survive through whatever he's going to throw at me. For this event, RTO chose to use the battlefield layouts. And I thought it was actually a really good idea, and I might steal that for future events. It helps speed up the game by just giving a set amount of terrain, and the terrain spread was actually pretty good. I liked the limit a little bit because it added a little bit more strategy than what I would probably normal do when I'm running a lot of Pathfinder units, which is just double stakes. So the first game mode, we had Somber Battlefield, and we had one stake, one low wall, and two corpse piles to use with on Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is the quintessential game mode. It's five objectives. Each one has an objective token. They're symmetrically laid out. At the end of round two, you score a victory point for each one that you are controlling. You control them by completely overlapping them, and you can contest them by engaging a unit controlling one of those objectives with a unit of your own that has more ranks. Equal ranks still controls the objective and still scores at the end of the round. Terrain was pretty straightforward since the pieces were already selected for us, and anyone that knows me knows the only thing I love more than my grandmother are stakes when I'm running ranger trackers, and I usually put those between objectives so my trackers can freely pass through and my enemy can't. So I put those on one of the flank edges, and I get chosen to deploy first, and I put them over there. We flip on over the objectives, which I always forget about, but it didn't really change my deployment. My trackers go to stakes. He's going to go ahead and put his crossbowmen down the center, but leaning away from the trackers to try and protect them from them, I think, which makes a lot of sense. The crossbows are probably really only vulnerable to the trackers, considering the list that he's got going on and all the maneuverability and sentinel and overwatch and nonsense that he's got. I'm going to put my spears straight down the center, and I'm probably going to declare either his crossbows or his royal guard as their target for nightly vow. He's then going to place his royal guard straight down the center and next to Jokin to keep him protected and to contest that center objective. Coldhand's going to go next to my Shadow Tower Spears because I want to try and protect them from the oncoming ranged onslaught. The Stormcrow Mercs go on the far side, as far away from the Ranger Trackers, which again makes sense because the Trackers can easily get into their flank and just rip them apart. I'm going to put my veterans opposing them because I really want to shove my veterans inside of there. The more dice he has, the more damage he's going to take from disrupt, counter-strike, weakened, cold hands nonsense. Skirmishers go opposite my veterans, which makes complete sense. Veterans are really mostly vulnerable to ranged attacks, and skirmishers are going to give them a hard time, but I'm hoping taunt will make it a little bit easier for me. With that, the game gets underway. I'm going to activate Corrin first, because I got to choose turn order since I didn't get to choose the deployment zones. Corrin's going to go on horses, and I'm going to use him to influence and maneuver my trackers. That way, if the Royal Guard get a little too forward and get too far up, my Ranger trackers can threaten a pretty powerful shot off onto them. After that, he's going to activate Ariane and put her onto letters. He's going to use her to shut off all of my attachment abilities off of Dennis, just in case I go for an early nightly vow charge off onto the Royal Guard, who I have chosen as my target. He's going to use the weakened token onto my veterans, and then after that, I'm just going to take Donald, put him onto the bags, and remove that token. He tries to knock off my tempered by duty with a crown zap, which thankfully I pass. 
After that, I go ahead and activate Aemon onto the swords, using it to have my veterans destroy the low wall. I don't expect the low wall to be relevant this game, but, I mean, if I can, might as well. He's then going to have his Stormcrow mercs march up, and I'll respond by having my veterans move up. He's going to rising temperatures, my veterans, really early on, get it out of his hand so he can start drawing up more cards, which makes sense because I'm not getting swords at least until round three, if that. After that, he's going to go ahead and he's going to activate his Golden Company crossbows and he's going to march them up. I'm going to activate Cold Hands after that and not liking those crossbows one bit because Cold Hands does not like Sundering with only four wounds. He's going to maneuver and march all the way on over to the veterans to try and weaken some of the skirmisher attacks that are going to be against them and hopefully, if I'm lucky, get the Cold Hands disrupt combo against the Stone Crow Mercs. He's going to go ahead and move up his skirmishers, not all the way up because he's not trying to get charged, but enough that they can be a threat with their quick fire. I'm going to activate my Shadow Tower Spears, and I'm going to march them up to the point pretty aggressively because I hope his Royal Guard charge me. That way I don't have to deal with hold the line, I can eat the shield wall with my own set for charge, and then we can get to duking it out like men. However, I kind of forget that he's got the Overwatch, and it's not terrible though. I only take two wounds, but it's something that I'm definitely going to have to be conscious of going forward because I don't need to be taking any more Sundering attacks than I really should. Royal Guard are then going to march on up to get into that position and protect the flank of the Golden Company crossbows because sure enough, my tracker is going to do what my trackers do best, and they are going to fly on up. Unfortunately, Rising Temperatures number 2 comes on out, and that's actually really concerning because again, I'm not getting swords until round 3 at the earliest, and Arizo heart play might set me back, and I might be stuck with those Rising Temperatures until round 4, potentially the entirety of the game. He's going to start off by putting Alaria on the swords and using that to weaken my trackers. So he's going to be denying me swords, which is always a good plan. He's got range units to make good use of it and take a couple wounds off my spears. All in all, a really strong start to the round. So I have to respond by putting Corrin on bags, using his influence again on the trackers to try and keep that threat up. And I'm going to heal my spears up three. After that, he's going to go ahead and activate Ariane put the influence onto trackers again, and take the letters weakening cold hands. Ariane's basically shutting down my trackers hard, cutting off three of my orders. I use Donal and I pass, which is probably a really bad play, because right after that he's going to use Eris on the horses to reposition those royal guard to keep an eye on both my spears and the trackers. I'm able to still activate my trackers and use them to get into the rear of the royal guard, but Giving up the horses was probably a mistake because I could have made him use more resources to keep up with my maneuvering because those trackers are quick. Even with that maneuver, which he got for free off the horses, I'm able to get into his flank after the shift. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to use a Donald token to get rerolls and make it so that he can expend that weakened token on me. So I'm going to get a full rank off him since he can't shield wall those hits. Though he's going to use Sentinel after that to reposition his Golden Company crossbows a little bit and keep them a little bit safer from all of my stuff. He's then going to shoot my vets with his crossbows and take a wound off. I get really lucky and not take much damage. I'm going to use my spears and declare a charge against the Royal Guard. I've got rerolls on the charge, but quite honestly, I don't even necessarily care if I actually land it. Part of me hopes that I don't. I just want to declare the charge. That way, I don't trigger the Overwatch and I can get onto the point. I'm actually kind of hoping that I lowball it, and I'm considering rerolling into a bad roll so I can land on it. I'm not too worried about the panic test, but I roll a 5 off the top, and he played superior positioning, so YOLO, do it for the vine. I go on in there, and I get into his flank, so I'm going to be able to put out a lot onto him. And I have tempered by duty, so I use that to put a condition token onto him. I'm hoping that I don't have to do this, but I know I probably will. I use combat prowess when he tries to shield while expending that weakened token that I put on him so I can push some damage through. He had played dune tactics and superior positioning, so I burnt a lot of his resources, but... I don't get as much damage I was hoping considering what I did, and then he goes ahead and plays Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken to prevent another 3 damage off the Panic Test, and he sticks it onto me. Right after that, he's going to Cunning Ploy his Stormcrow Mercs so he can use the Retreat option on the Royal Guard and get back toward staring at my trackers. I use a Pivot Ruler to make sure I don't PJ Pivot. A helpful viewer commented that our 
pivots are pretty messy, so I dug my pivot ruler on out. I then maneuver my veterans as best I can, avoiding the overwatch and still getting in range to threaten the skirmishers, because if I can get a nice charge off onto them, I can at least tie them up and I can focus my resources like cards in the NCU board on the right side of the board. Plus, I've got Taunt, which is always a good order to have available and ready to use. He's going to activate his Royal Guard for real this time, and he's going to charge into my Ranger Trackers, and he's going to deal a whopping seven wounds because he still gets to throw seven dice, even though he's only got one guy into that last rank. But I saved Eamon just for this reason, and I heal my Trackers up two wounds to get them back up to two ranks. I zap the Rainbow Guard, but get nothing out of it. Skirmishers are going to use Scout Opening and then maneuver on up to shoot at my veterans. Again, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I don't even have him in my flank. It's face on. Yeah, he's got the scout opening, so he'll get a lot of hits, but I'm saving on fours. Statistically speaking, I'm going to block half of these, right? Wrong. I go ahead and I take a whop seven wounds off of this. It was miserable, and now I'm very nervous about what's going on. So I just go ahead and put Cold Hand onto the flank, onto that point, because I'm probably going to have to move the veteran somewhere safer. He plays Rionis Vengeance at the start of that turn, and he places it onto the Spears. Something really important to note at this point, though, is we're about to go into round three, and we only have about 25 minutes left on the clock. This game's been going pretty slow because my opponent has been thinking through all of his moves very carefully, which has been really draining away at the clock, and you're going to see shortly that's going to come to hurt him. I go first round three. I'm going to put Eamons onto swords, using the heal on the veterans to get them up a little bit, and the swords onto the trackers themselves. I'm not expecting any damage at all off this. I just really want to drop rising temperatures so I can use my cards on my trackers and try and keep them alive. They do actually manage to get a pretty solid hit, so the vulnerable gets expended, shield wall gets used, but then Arianne's going to go ahead and grab the bags and heal up the spear boys and influence my trackers yet again. I'm going to go ahead and put Donald onto the horses and retreat my trackers back towards the point. Not onto it. I have my activation for that. I'm just trying to get away from the Royal Guard and pull them away from the rest of the fight. He's going to go ahead and activate the Royal Guard right after that and charge right back on in. It's not a guaranteed charge, so I'm really hoping he just flops it and doesn't get in because with the martial training, he might just kill me. As long as I don't start engaged with him, though, and have to deal with the hold the line, I should be okay, but he is still going to make that charge. He's going to get in there, and again, he's going to do a ton of damage on this attack. The vulnerable token and being able to throw those seven dice, get rerolls all the time, no matter the terrain, is really helping him through. So he's going to drop me down to just two wounds left, and I'm going to play the fire that burns against the coal to reroll the morale test. I still fail it, but I only take one wound, leaving me with a healthy three, which I'm way more comfortable with. Now I use their actual activation, and I retreat them back, and with the pivot, I'm able to secure myself onto that point. He takes Eris to go for a lucky crown zap, and while he does get me to panic, I only lose one wound, so they're okay. He's then going to go ahead and get a weakened token on him when I put corn onto the letters and draw up. His turn, he plays Brothers of Arms onto his Stormcrow Mercs, turning them on, and now all of a sudden, they're a threat again. He's going to use his activation with the crossbows to shoot my spears in the face and, again, do a whopping ton of damage and really whittle away at them. I'm going to go ahead and get my veterans engaged on into those skirmishers because that's a pretty safe charge for me, which I land, and I get on in there. I've got the rising temperature, so I have no card support, and I'm hitting on fours, so I'm really not expecting to do much off this, but the skirmishers are kind of squishy, so any damage I get is nice. All I really want to do is make sure that they're engaged. I wasn't expecting this. He hits me with the diversion tactic and get the Storm Chrome Mercs out towards his flank. Instead of going for the obvious bait that is the veterans, he gets on into the flank of my Shadow Tower Spears. And again, this is nine dice. I've got the Raven Flock, though, to get him down to fives. And with the Corpse File, he's not going to get much through especially since I'm going to hit him with the set for charge. That doesn't actually drop his dice rank, but it does put him into a more precarious position. I take a fair amount of damage, but not as much as I was afraid. So, on my activation, I'm going to go ahead and play Sword in the Darkness, attaching it to my Shadow Tower Spears, that way they're attacking at plus one rank. What's really important to note is I'm not trying to kill these guys here. 
I'm trying to drop them a rank so I can make sure that when I realign with my attack, I have equal ranks, I control the objective, and I score another point. I'm probably winning based off the points I have alone because I've got cold hands and my tracker scoring. And this is our final round. At this point in time, I think we have about five minutes left on the clock, so I don't need to kill anything. I just need to not die, though if I could pad the points a little bit better, it might get me better tournament scoring in the end. I completely forget about the Sentinel, and he charges me in the flank. Thankfully, after I use Shields of the Realms of Men, I managed to make all of my armor saves. I'm not going to be scoring off that center point, unfortunately, but I'm still scoring two, and he's only going to be getting one. He's thinking the same thing, so he gets the skirmishers and he makes the attack because he doesn't have enough space to retreat. I use combat prowess on his scout openings to really help stay up because, I mean, if I can get a rank off of him with the counter-strike and make sure he doesn't score, it does me just as much good as if I was able to score off the center point. That doesn't happen. We stay equal ranks. But still, cold hand scores me one, tracker score me one, and that's it. He gets his one point off that, and the score ends three to two. And I just want to take this moment to explain to everybody. A lot of our decisions in those final few moments were with the knowledge that we wouldn't be going to a round four. Maybe we would have played differently if we were going to a round four. And if we were going to a round four, I think his odds were pretty good. My trackers were really low. My veterans weren't doing great either. And he's got great action economy with the skirmishers. The Golden Company crossbows probably wouldn't have gotten themselves stuck in the center. Instead, they would have stayed unengaged and just shot my veterans in the flank. I'd have to sacrifice Corrin to keep one of my three vulnerable units alive, but that doesn't do much for the other two. Maybe I could save one of the other two with aim and bags, but there's a lot of what if there. He was in a really strong position, and if he played faster during the rest of the game, I think there was a really good chance he would have ended up beating me at the end of round four, maybe early round five, and gotten a dominant position. I think he did a fantastic job, considering... He's probably just breaking into double digit games, maybe 11-12, and I've played an embarrassing amount of this game in the past few years. Embarrassing because I'm still not very good. So he gave me a run for my money and was, without a doubt, the closest game that I had the entire tournament. It set me pretty far down on the bracket, and I ended up getting paired with somebody who lost their game because it was a narrow victory for me. And since it was only a narrow defeat for him, it helped him a lot going forward. But again, he could have had that victory. So something that's really important for a lot of players that go into the competitive setting, which I really recommend. It's a lot of fun. You play different people, different kinds of games. It's great. But something to keep in mind is the clock can be your enemy. Slow play can really hurt you and diminish your chance of coming back from a really narrow margin. Because this game is very swingy sometimes. I'm very grateful to have had the opponent that I did, and I look forward to playing against him in the future. Stay tuned for the next tournament game that we had from this event, where I face off against a good friend of mine and someone who I like to think I taught the way of the Baratheon.